Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining in to this session in, uh, on a Saturday evening. Um, so today I'm going to uh, talk about Patrick, basically, which is the uh, Go framework that uh, I use to do simulations. Uh, essentially, it's a cellular automator framework. Uh, so uh, this is the first time I'm doing this presentation, um, but I actually have this on a uh, blog post uh, as well. So if you are interested in this, you can always go to the blog post and uh, follow it up. Or you know, if you can't follow what I'm saying here, uh, maybe you can actually do better on, on the blog post. OK, so uh, let me start. Right, so cellular automator. I guess most people, if you are uh, from a comm science background, you will probably have uh, encountered cellular automator in the past. Um, so automator is the uh, uh, plural of automaton, um, which essentially means it's a machine that can act independently. So uh, essentially, if you look at uh, today's logo, it's uh, what people would normally call an agent, right? uh, it's an autonomous agent. Um, but cellular automator is kind of interesting because uh, it's based on a simulation that's a uh, uh, grid so it has a grid of cells. It has been invented a long, long time ago by some of the luminaries of our industry, uh, Stanislaw Eula and uh, John von Neumann. So uh, for those who would know a little bit of the history of, uh, of computing and, and programming, right, you know these are some of the pioneers in our space. Um, so one of the more popular uses of, or, or more popular uh, way that people actually interact with uh, cellular automator is this uh, uh, thing called the game of life right that's uh, basically a simulation um, we start off as a mathematical puzzle uh, that's based on cellular automator uh, invented by uh, this uh, mathematician slash programmer called john conway uh, very unfortunately he passed away recently a couple of months ago uh, but uh, this is one of his uh, greatest legacies and uh, was first published in his uh, in Martin Gardner's uh, Mathematical Games column in the uh, very famous Scientific American magazine. I'm not sure how many of you actually read Scientific American anymore, but uh, it is actually a, a pretty amazing uh, magazine. And Mathematical Games is also a very uh, popular column uh, at one point in time. Um, so what is Game of Life? So Game of Life is a simulation that's done within grid of cells, um, a cellular automator. Uh, it has a few rules. So the first rule is that any life cell that has less than two life neighbors will, will die. And the second rule is that uh, any life cell with more than three life neighbors will also die. Right? But if you happen to have exactly two or three life neighbors, then you'll live on to the next generation. And if you have exactly three life neighbors, uh, you would you would regenerate and you would come back alive, right? So what do you mean by neighbors? So we look at uh, this particular uh, grid of nine cells. Imagine that you are the cell right in the center, then your neighbors are basically the eight cells that are surrounding you, right? So this is uh, uh, the game of life rules, and uh, this is how the, the, the game uh, works. So um, I used to do a lot of, uh, I mean, I, I still do, I do actually do a lot of uh, simulation. And uh, one of the kind of simulations that I, I really like to do is a, a cellular automator simulations. Um, and I've done a, a number of them. And uh, a few months back, I was thinking that I've done so many of them. Uh, why don't I just you know create a framework to, to allow myself to do this a uh, lot more effectively? and uh, to just sort of uh, use the same framework over and over again, right? Essentially, you'll be using my same, the same code that I, I, I do for uh, some of these simulations. So what I did was um, to create this uh, framework called Petri, and uh, it's essentially a Go-based cellular automator framework, and uh, it focuses on building grid-based simulations. Uh, the default implementation is a game of life simulation, so uh, this is a screenshot, or rather, this is a GIF of a uh, some of, of one of the uh, simulations I ran. 
and this is something that you will see exactly. So how does it work? Um, the basic implementation is, is very, very simple. Um, basically, you create an instance of uh, the default implementation, and you use the, the run function to run it. And, and that's really all there is to it. Uh, if you want to customize further, though, then you need to do uh, a little bit more. First of all, you need to implement the simulator interface. Uh, simulator is a representation of the simulation. Uh, and the two most important methods in this interface are the init method and the uh, process method. Uh, the rest of it, you can again, then again fall back on the default implementation. It is quite kind of self-explanatory, uh, so I won't really go through each one of these pros, uh, each one of these uh, methods. But uh, I just want to talk a little bit more about the two most important uh, methods, which is init and process. So the init method, it's the name says it all, right? It uh, calls before the simulation starts. It initializes the simulation, um, and the most basic thing it needs to do is really just to populate the grid because you need to grid to be populated before you start the simulation. And init does exactly that. Um, the process method uh, is called every generation of the simulation. So uh, at every iteration, uh, something happens. And uh, basically, you run this method every generation. And this is normally where all the main logic and rules reside. So the process is where the bulk of your logic will reside. So obviously, you can use that as a launch pad to call the other logic that you have. But uh, if you're doing a relatively simple simulation, then uh, mostly everything will be inside it. OK, so that's a very quick description of what Petri is. It's actually quite simple. Let me quickly jump into uh, the code itself. So uh, let me go full screen on this guy, full screen. Okay, so uh, let me go to the basic, right? So this is it. This is all the code there is. And um, if I switch over to the, uh, let me try to find where it is. Uh -huh, here it is. Okay, let me open up a little bit. You can see my terminal here. This is basically the code. And uh, I will build this. And then I will uh, call basic. Right. So um, when I call it, you can see the simulation running. Um, the simulation basically runs on a web server, uh, which is that's part of the simulation. And uh, yeah, this simulation doesn't really do much because it just, just ends really quickly. Uh, but you can always keep running. You can uh, run it over and over again. And uh, sometimes it does something a little bit more interesting, like uh, what is happening here now. Right. So the basic simulation is is just a game of life. Um, very simple. If you want to show a game of life and you want this thing to just go on forever, you can just turn this on and, and there you go. Right. So nothing very fancy. Um, I'll keep this running and see what happens uh, later. OK, let me get back to the slides. So that's the uh, very basic simulation with nothing really much. Uh, so there's this thing called a gospel's gun. Essentially, it is a game of life, uh, but it simulates a gun. And uh, this is a schematic of the gun itself. right? So you look carefully at this guy. And let me quickly get back into the code. So that's gun. That's the gun code. Let me uh, go and show you the code itself. A little bit more involved now. So you look here, The uh, essentially, this part is still the same. If you look at the simulation, um, if I create a simulation, uh, what simulation is this? So this is this, is this one. I create my sim, uh, which has this anonymous variable, Petri sim. 
and uh, I override the default sims init method. I don't override the process method because I, the process method in the uh, default implementation is game life. So I'm going to reuse that. So I'm not going to override it. Um, but what init does is basically it will create a gun, and the gun uh, is the, the pattern of the gun is this one. Uh, if you go back to the slides again, uh, essentially that's uh, that's. Where is, it? Where is my slides? Oh. Essentially, it's this guy. Okay, so let me stop the uh, simulation, the previous simulation. Okay, let me just show this to you. Okay, uh, go build. I already built it, but I'm, I'm going to just run it again just to show that it's actually running. So, this is again. So this gospel scan, uh, and this is the uh, simulation using Game of Life. Right, so it's, it's actually quite simple. Nothing really very uh, complicated about this, but that's the beauty of uh, cellular automator. Uh, you can actually create quite a lot of very interesting things. There's a whole ton of very, very fascinating uh, things you can do with just the Game of Life with uh, different starting points of the pattern. Okay, let me just stop this and get back into the, uh, the slides. Uh, go. Okay, um, the next thing that I'm going to talk a little bit about is uh, this thing called Elementary Cellular Automator. Um, in 2002, Stephen Wolfram, um, so you, you probably know him, he created the uh, uh, Mathematica, he also created the uh, programming language. Uh, in 2002, he wrote this really gigantic book, a uh, thousand over pages uh, book called A New Kind of Science. And uh, it has a lot of his ideas in it, which, uh, and uh, the main part of the idea is something that he called the elementary cellular automator. So it is cellular automator, uh, but on a, on a very elementary basis. And he believes, Wolfram believes that the world can be explored uh, if you use experiments in simulations built using these elementary cellular automator. Right? It is quite a controversial, um, quite a controversial book when it first came out. And I think today is still uh, a little bit controversial. Uh, it has been almost 20 years and he has uh, republished a new kind of science. It's actually available for free online. So if you're interested, you can check it out. It's a really thick book though. Um, Without going to the controversy, let me just describe what elementary cellular automator is and how Petri can be used to also implement it. So what is elementary cellular automator? It uh, refers to the most basic kind of uh, cellular automator. It's basically a 1D CA, right? Uh, what do you mean by 1D? So basically it's just a line of, a line of cells, like a, a grid with all of these boxes. Um, how do you simulate it? So it's exactly the same way as we have previously. Uh, the rules of the CA depends on its neighbors. So if you remember earlier on our uh, rules for the 2D CA, basically we have uh, the uh, cell and it's influenced by its neighbors, the eight neighbors that surround it. Here, you only have two neighbors. Basically, you have the left and the right. So imagine here again, if you are the center guy here, uh, your two neighbors are the one to your left and uh, to your right. right? And uh, this particular pattern here, 001, will influence the next generation, uh, what is going to be here, right? the question mark here. So um, you can imagine that uh, this three, this three uh, uh, numbers, this three, uh, uh, binary numbers, then will be uh, the, the thing that determines what happens to this particular cell. And you can determine a set of rules that uh, try to figure out what this uh, cell state is going to be at the next generation. So it can be many things, but let's assume this set of rules, right? So if you say 111, it will become 0, 110 will become 1, so on and so on. So this is arbitrary. 
uh, this is the set of rules that let's say I I put it like so. So in this case, if you look previously uh, at that sing single or one VCA, so zero zero one, uh, and if you look here, zero zero one, where is it? Zero zero one. The next state will be a one. So you see here, the next state will be a one. Okay. So that's in essence what a 1d ca is a 1d cellular automator is uh so how can we use petri to do this and uh, how does it translate uh to a 2d world so converting into a 2d ca just as normal any other ca uh if you place the next generations of the 1d ca below its previous generation it's essentially something that you get you get something like this yeah uh this pattern is called a spasinski spasinski triangle and uh, it's created using the rules that i just defined earlier on okay this uh, elementary ca rules uh the one that i show you just now uh, which is one zero one one zero one zero which you know, really quickly go back here right so one zero one one zero one zero if you look at this number, is basically the base two equivalent of base ten ninety. So this particular rule is also known as uh, rule ninety. And since there are a maximum of eight bits to the power three uh, uh, number of rule sets, because you only have like uh, three bits: the, your left neighbor, your right neighbor, and yourself. Uh, so the maximum number of rule sets for an elementary cellular automate is basically 26 but this 26 you can you can see a huge variety of them so for example this is rule 90 if you run uh this is run using uh patrick uh, this is rule 110 uh, this is rule 30. okay so let me quickly try to uh jump into a demo okay so here um Again, I call it my sim. Just can't think of a better name. Like uh, you have a anonymous variable, Patrick sim. You, I overwrite the default sims uh, init method, and uh, I also overwrite the uh, process method as well. Right. So this is the code. Uh, I won't go through each uh, part of the code. It's actually not very complicated. Just. Uh, Slightly a bit more mathematics than the previous one, and um, the important thing is, is for example here, I uh, allow a setting of a parameter, right? So the uh, the rules here. So if I use the uh, to this guy rule, let's say ninety, let's start at uh, eighty. Right, so you see this is uh, how you end. Um, of course, you can make this a lot bigger. So let me try to make it a lot bigger. I just actually, I forgot the, uh, uh, what was the, the flag for that? Uh, the width. So my, my default width is um, 36. Let me try to make it a 60 cell. Right, so this becomes like this. It's because I'm starting at 18. So 60, if I start right in the middle, it should be 30. So let me go start again at 30. So you see the simulation, this is, this is how it looks like. Uh, let's go look at a different rule. It can take a while. So because it, uh, every, every line is basically a, a new generation. Let's take a rule. Uh, one one zero. Right, so uh, this is how it looks like. So if you are interested in uh, a new kind of science, you are interested in uh, what Stephen Bottrom uh, is saying, and you really think his head is right, you want to play around with it, you can always take a look at Petri and uh, see how you can implement or follow up some of his, uh, his the things that he said. Okay, so the code is quite simple. Uh, 
uh, no, sorry, not this one. The code is quite simple. Uh, it's all here. It's just like less than 100 lines of code. Uh, play around with it, muck around with it. Okay, so this is the uh, um, cellular automator. And uh, this is essentially the, the basic forms of Petri. Uh, let me go into something slightly different now. It's uh, not exactly, it is still cellular automator, but uh, I am looking at a different kind of simulation. Right. Um, this at one point in time was actually quite uh, well known, but in any case, uh, in 2009, this cartographer, uh, his name is Bill Rankin, he came out with uh, quite a quite an interesting map that shows how racially segregated Chicago is. Right? So if you look at the map to the right, uh, you can see like the white people in, in Chicago, the uh, or the uh, uh, magenta colored ones, then the black people are the one in blue. And you can tell very clearly, it's, it's very, very straight. Like look, this line here basically demarcates where the white people stays and uh, where the, the, the black people stays, right? And, uh, and you look at the Hispanics, they also occupy certain lines here. There's a line here uh, and that really cuts through where the black and Hispanics live. Right? So it's, it's quite startling. And so after this map came out, uh, quite a few other cartographers and, and people look, hey, you know, can I, can I create similar maps of other cities in the US? And so they did. And uh, not surprisingly, you can see many of the cities also behave the same way. But you look at Detroit, for example, uh, these are the, the whites that are in red and uh, the blacks are in blue. It's uh, almost a straight line right across here. It's pretty, pretty uh, mind boggling to see this kind of uh, segregation. And um, is it only in US? And actually, no. Uh, somebody did the same thing for London as well. Uh, this is actually an interactive map, but uh, I took it out, took a snapshot, and, and pasted it here. And uh, for the most multicultural city in the world, Toronto, uh, somebody did that as well. And you can see also, while it is not as as uh, clearly segregated as some of the cities in in US, you can still see that the big part of uh, certain people, certain uh, ethnicities, really live in certain areas, and others live in other areas. It's quite clear they are quite clearly demarcated and segregated, uh, even for the most multicultural city in the world. Right? Um, Back to the simulation. So in 1971, this gentleman called Thomas Schelling, uh, who is a pretty famous economist, uh, American economist, he wrote this paper on racial segregation called uh, Dynamic Models of Segregation. And in this paper, he described a model to demonstrate how racial segregation can easily come about um, without actually some somebody doing uh, a lot of things about it. And uh, the way that he did it was, was actually pretty straightforward. He only used two races, uh, the black and the white. And uh, he used a hash and a zero. And uh, basically, every iteration of this grid, uh, he would use, he would actually generate this uh, on a, uh, a, a piece of paper, right? And then he would generate it from uh, one generation to another generation on, on paper. So the rules are quite simple. Uh, everyone has a place at any point in time. So uh, they, I can't remember which is which, but uh, one race will be the hash, the other one will be the zero. And at any one point in time, they would have a place. And the next generation, he's, he or she is uh, free to move to any other space that is empty. Uh, you control the simulation using a few parameters, the, the neighborhood size, for example. Uh, the second is the demanded percentage of one's own race. Uh, basically, how many of your neighbors are of the same race as you are. Then the ratio of uh, the, the, the two different races, which is the black and the white in the whole population. Uh, as in, you know, what's the what's the, what's the uh, number of people who live, uh, uh, the number of, of, of people in the other race who is on this map. Uh, then the other rule is the uh, rule, particular rule that governs the movement of people. In Shannon's case, he uh, modeled it in such a way that uh, you cannot move too far away 
from where you, you uh, come from. So that was a rule. And finally, the number of vacancies. So obviously, if you have uh, no vacancies on the map, then you can't really, or on, on the grid, then you can't really move anywhere else. So I, what I did was uh, I rebuilt Schelling's model using Petri, and uh, I changed some of the parameters. Uh, but most of them are the same. The, I think the, the major thing that is different for me is that I did not actually limit the, the, uh, how far somebody can go in terms of moving around uh, the grid. Uh, uh, and I re sort of enlarged his simulation as well. So Schelling only had two, the black and the white, because I think it's kind of hard to do more uh, on paper. Uh, obviously, I didn't do on paper. I did on a computer, so I enabled uh, any number of races. So ob ob of course, if you have too many, then it, it actually becomes too difficult to see. Um, in the uh, example, or rather the, the image, the GIF that I have on the right, you can see that there are three races. Uh, and then uh, the rest of the parameters are the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a demo of uh, how this works. OK, so it's the same. Um, some rules in terms of the, uh, the parameters here. Here I use uh, a ratio, race ratio. Uh, and also the number of races here. Uh, and the rest is actually also not very uh, not very complicated. So um, the code is here. If you want, you can just take a look at it. It's uh, uh, available on the, the blog post, and you can just download it and uh, take a look at it. But let me just show you the, the simulation itself. OK, so that's the code. Uh, so I use three races. So um, basically, one, one, one here means that uh, three races equal. They are all equal sizes, and uh, the min here means every every uh, race has a preference, and the preference is it's at the minimum it must have uh, four or more neighbors that are same race as I am. If I have uh, Less than that, I will shift if I have or I move to a, a, a different vacant spot. And uh, if I have uh, more than that, then I will just stay put. Right. The max is the reverse. If I have uh, uh, less than that, then I would uh, uh, stay put. If I have more than that, then I will move. Right. So why is there a max? So I put a max here, which is not in the ori Schelling's original uh, model. The reason why I put a max is because I wanted to simulate something else, you know, something different, which is a uh, sort of like a, uh, a, a rule or some kind of mandate that uh, within a neighborhood, you cannot have um, people who are of the same race as you are more than a certain number of people, so a certain percentage of people. Like So for example, uh, if you have more than uh, six people who six neighbors who are of the same race as you are then you know you are not allowed to continue living there you have to move away so that's the kind of uh, cap that i was trying to to simulate but anyway here is the simulation let me just uh, run very quickly and so you see that the the, the races do segregate themselves self-segregation essentially um, and they will cluster towards their, their own people uh, pretty rapidly. Uh, so obviously, there are other different uh, scenarios, and uh, uh, the part of the fun is really to play around with the ratios, play around with the, the mins, because the numbers can be different, right? So let's see, um, I can do this. So this guy, he doesn't really matter. Uh, it doesn't really matter to this particular race, uh, the, the neighbors. And you can sort of guess which race it is, right? It's, it's, uh, in case you don't know, it's the, the green one. Uh, it don't really care, so that's how it goes. But does it stop the other races from clustering, from uh, segregating themselves? No, it doesn't. Right? The, the green race. They are okay. They they are okay to be uh, everywhere, but uh, it doesn't actually help in the overall scheme of things, yeah. and so on and so forth. So this this kind of simulation uh, basically allows you to test out certain theories, test out certain uh, certain scenarios that you, you think might be true. Uh, you can 
can actually change the rules, can change the parameters. But I think overall, what I, I wanted to, to do with Patrick is really to, to create a framework where you can create such simulations uh, quickly. So um, obviously for this particular uh, case, it's all CA, it's all within the grid. Uh, but I think a lot of uh, simulations can be uh, simplified into a grid and you can test out uh, uh, different scenarios using it. So uh, if you are interested in this kind of uh, simulations, uh, feel free to just get hold of the code, get hold of uh, Petri and try it out yourself. And that's it. That's all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed that. And back to you, Tikshu. So the one of them is also Stanley. Oh, oh, this is a Stanley. <laughs> okay. Okay. What actions governments can take to observation some of these models to promote racial harmony and how would this tune the parameters of the real life situation? Um, so one of the reasons why I put in the max is really to simulate that environment, right? So in, in Singapore, there is an act that uh, prevents you from staying in a particular location if there are more, uh, I mean, a certain ratio of races can only exist in, in a certain uh, 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 neighborhood. You cannot have, say, an exclusively Chinese or exclusively Indian or exclusively whatever uh, Malay uh, uh, neighborhood. That actually uh, is not allowed. Right. So the law is, I can't remember exactly what the name of the law is now. I, I was doing some research on it and I found out. Um, but um, so how did it work out for Singapore? I would say, I would say, okay, I, I don't really know. Uh, but if you look at my simulation, right, the max doesn't really help. <laughs> the max does not really uh, give you any advantage at all. So uh, if I can just quickly run the simulation, right? So it, it, it here means basically it, it, it is, there's nothing. Okay, so let's let's put a six here. Uh, or let's go back to the four. What happens? Chaos happens, right? Because everybody keeps moving. Nobody can stay. Yeah. Uh, and this is not a desired state, right? So that, that becomes a problem. Uh, and why is it that everybody uh, moves away? And the reason is because of, of this, right? Uh, it's because of this, this 444 here. Yeah. Because uh, people are generally not so tolerant of their neighbors. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's move it to a 222. It stabilizes. And you can see it's pretty diversified, right? So what does it tell you? It, it, what does it tell? tell you from the simulation. It basically says that the, the cap doesn't really help anything. The max doesn't really help anything. It's the min. The min means that how tolerant you are to others. That is what really helps. Not the uh, not the government rules that tell you, no, this ratio cannot exist in this, this particular context. Right? But again, to be fair, this is my simulation. Uh, in reality, how does this, uh, how did it actually turn out for Singapore? I, I think, I mean, Singapore is pretty harmonious, but uh, can we say it's because of the um, of this, the rules? I, I don't really know. But for my simulation, I, I think uh, probably not, I, I would say. Yeah, so so I don't know how controversial that is, but uh, I, I just said it. Okay. Uh, hope nobody, like, uh, is just, <laughs> just come knocking at my door later. Um, okay. So Suyin asked, uh, the problem is not, or uh, he made a comment, the problem is not the results, not typically this minister in Japan hardly on initial conditions, butterfly creating a hurricane syndrome. So the, the initial, um, most of my, my initial are actually randomized. Uh, so you can keep running different random scenarios. So obviously if you create something that's uh, deterministic initially, then it can sort of escalate into different things. Um, so I, I guess that's that's what it is. But uh, for my simulations, they are all randomized. So uh, I, I did not get any scenarios where you know uh, if I run something, it's very radically different from a, a different set of uh, starting scenarios. So uh, for me, at least, that never really happened. But obviously, I did spend all my time, you know, doing this over and over and over again. I did it quite a lot of times, but uh, I never really encountered uh, such a scenario. Although I cannot uh, dispute that maybe something 
uh, might happen if you run it long enough. Um, Matt asks, is there anything specific about Go that makes writing these kind of simulations easy? Um, I think I think what helped for me is uh, is being able to. Uh, I mean, it's the speed of of uh, Go actually helps me a lot in this. And um, I am not sure whether it is Go specifically that uh, uh, will be very helpful to writing this kind of simulations. I just enjoy Go, and uh, Go is a language I enjoy writing in, and uh, simulations is something I enjoy doing. So I put uh, one and one together, and it came out with this. Uh, but I, I think um, Go help me in a way that it is uh, it is relatively simple to write this with and uh, the speed that I can actually generate the different generations uh, is pretty useful as well. Now to be fair I have not done this in say Python or Java right? and then started to do comparisons in terms of the length, the, the speed and, and, and everything but uh, at least for me is is speedy enough. Um, the setting here if I if I look uh, if I have enough time uh, I can show a little bit more. Let's try to open the other one, which is uh, Patri. Right. So um, I have a lot of different types of settings. Uh, let me go to the. I have. Uh, I have a number of uh, uh, different settings, right? So I can change the cell size, I can change the refresh rate, uh, I can make it run a lot faster. The the grid size is relatively small, so it's 36 times 36, uh, X number of cells. Uh, you can go pretty big, I can go like uh, hundreds and, and thousands, right, in, in terms of the size. Uh, to a certain to a certain level, it will stop being effective anymore because uh, the refresh rate will be just too slow. Um, but I think uh, it can go quite big before I hit that particular ceiling. So I think that's one more thing that uh, really helped uh, in Go. So, I do have one question. Uh, why do you name it Petri as a framework? Oh, Petri dish. Right. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, it's a Petri dish. So it's a Petri dish and there are cells in it. So then the cells grow, so that's why it's called Patrick. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of corny, I know, but uh, you know, yeah, I, it's just just me. <laughs>